Thank you very much. Um, I'm Kenichi Asai. I'm, um, I'm really honored to have opportunity to give a talk here today. I'd like to thank Zishan and all the organizers, and I, I, I would like, also like to thank all the, all the audience uh, coming to the conference. So I'm one of the rare species who uses delimited continuation constructs shift and reset in day-to-day -day programming. So after I inter introduce what the delimited continuations are, I would like to um, introduce a lot, lot of examples to share the feeling that I have um, with you about the delimited continuations. So I will go into the six examples in the increasing order of complexities. And then I will finally speculate some future of the delimited continuation that I want to see. But before I go into the main topic, I, well, this is the Papers We Love conference, so I would like to talk a little bit about the papers. And uh, these are the RE papers, RE representative papers on control operators. And the first one is about control operator, control and prompt, and the other two about, it's about the shift and reset. And they are, they are similar, but a little bit different. But well, I, I don't go into the difference today. Um, and uh, for you, the last one is the uh, introductory paper that is suitable for many people. So it, is, it will be a nice introduction to delimited continuations. And, um, but that paper is based on the CPS transformation. So you need to know about the CPS transformation. But today I don't go into the CPS transformation, but I would, would, would um, explain what the delimited continuations are in the direct style. So that is, in, in, the, <clears throat> in mindset, that is more close to a license paper. Okay, so let's begin. What are the continuations? Well, this, Maybe I should see that. Okay, what are continuations? Well, continuations are the rest of the computation. So whenever you, you talk about the rest, it, it, is, a, uh, it is a relative, con con relative concept. So you need to talk about the current and the rest. So we, I, I, will talk about, well, I will talk about the current computation and I will describe it inside the bracket and the rest of the computation outside the bracket. So for example, let's have that, that arithmetic expression, three plus five times two minus one. Well, the first thing that we want to do is five times two. Okay, so that is the current computation. And what is the rest of the computation? Okay, once we get back the result of five times two, then we want to do add three to it and m minus one from it. So that's the rest of the, uh, rest of the con computation, and that, and that is the computation. Uh, I need to switch my brain into English mode. I came here <laughs> from Japan last night, and it's not completely working right now. So I, okay, <laughs> start over. So the current continuation is three plus something minus one. So given a value for the whole, um, add three to it and subtract one from it, that is the continuation. So it, if, so it is a fu like a function. So given a value for whole, which is x, then we want to compute three plus x minus one. Okay, what, what are continuations? Well, as comp computation proceeds, continuation changes. So at first we are talking about the five times two and the con current continuation is plus three and minus one. But once we get back the result of five times two, which is 10, then we, the next thing we want to do is the three plus 10. So that is a current, that becomes the current co computation. And then at that time, the current continuation is just minus one. And when we get back the uh, 13, then the last thing we want to do is 13 minus one. So that is the current computation. And the current continuation will be empty. Okay, here are some examples. Please identify the current expressions, continuations, and their types. Okay, well, for the first example, well, what the first thing we want to do is two times three, if we assume that the computation goes from left to right. So the current computation is two times three, and then the current, com current continuation is something that do the rest of the work. So the type of two times three is integer. 
So the type of the continuation will be given an integer for the whole. We'll compute the rest of the computation and gives back an integer. So that's the type of the continuation. So for the second one, we want to, we, we want to concatenate two strings, either hello or hi, with world. And this hat operator is a concatenation operator for string. So the first thing we want to do is, OK, we want to decide that what the predicate part is. So that is 2 equals 3. And then given that value, we want to do the rest of the computation. So 2 equals 3 is a Boolean. <laughs> And so the continuation will receive that value for the boolean and receives uh, and <coughs> produce some string, either hello world or hi world. So that's string. I think this is easy. OK, then what are delimited continuations? So delimited continuation is the rest of the computation up to some delimiter. So in this talk, I will use the syntax reset fun uh, unit rom. So this will delimit that con uh, <coughs> delimit the context up to the reset. So for example, if we write like that, then the current, con current computation is five, type five times two. But since the three plus five times two is surrounded by reset, so the current delimited continuation is only up to the delimiter. So we have only three plus. And minus one is out of the context. So it's not included in the delimited continuation. OK, so here are some examples. <coughs> uh, identify the delimited continuation and their types. OK, for the first one, well, the current computation is 2 times 3. So the current com continuation is um, add 3 times 4. But that, it does not include 5 times because it is outside the delim delimiter. And its type is given the value for the whole, which is integer, then we will um, get back some integer as a result. So for the second one, um, the current computation is 2 equals 3. And then the continuation is up to the delimiter. So it is this entire if expression, but it excludes adding the world, string world. And the type of it is, well, given that Boolean for the predicate, but we will get back string. I think this is easy, OK? OK, so now we know what the continuations are, what the delimited continuations were. So now we talk about how to use it. And to, co to extract the continuation, we use the, the shift operator. And this shift operator has this kind of this syntax. And shift fun k arrows m. And when this expression is executed, it does three things. It clears the current continuation. Then it binds that cleared continuation to k. And it executes the body m in the empty context. So for example, in this example, what happens is that it first clears the current continuation. The current continuation in this example is 3 plus. So the 3 plus part is cleared, so it, it goes away. And it is, bind to the, it is bound to the variable k. So this k gets 3 plus. And then the body of the, continue, compute, body of the uh, function is executed. So that's what the shift operator does. So it clears, bind, executes. So it, this is somewhat complicated, but we will see a number of examples today. OK, so the first one, how to discard continuations. They, we use this idiom, so shift fun k rom, but that variable k does not appear in the body of m, body m. So it, k is not used in m, so I, I use the underline so that it, it pretends that the uh, uh, variable is not used in m. So the continuation is captured, but because it is not used, it is just discarded. And this is the same as raising an exception. So for example, um, in this example, we say 3 plus, and then we want to do some shift. And at this point, shift will, um, sorry, shift will clear, the, clear, the current continu clear the current continuation, which is 3 plus, And then it binds it to k and executes its body. So it becomes like the second line. And because 
in the second line, 2 does not mention k, so the current continuation is just discarded. And the value of reset expression becomes 2, and 2 minus 1 becomes 1. So that's how it goes. OK, for, <coughs> let's replace the whole with the shift km for some m. So what, how can we discard the current, continu current continuation? OK, we want to insert some shift fun under the arrow something into the whole. So in the first example, if we, <laughs> if we insert that expression into the whole, then it will capture the current continuation. Sorry, it clears the current continuation. It binds it to k. And then it will return the question mark as the result of the reset expression. So in this case, we need that result will be multiplied by 5, so we have to return some integer there. So if we return 3 there, then the final answer will be 15. In the second case, well, oops. In the second case, <coughs> we clear the current contention with its if expression. We bind it to k, but we don't use it and return something. And that something will be concatenated to the string world. So we have to return some uh, string there. So if we return chow there, then we will re receive chow world. And the one point is that we need the type of the context to fill in the body of the shift, which appears deep in the middle of some, some <coughs> complex expression. We have to think about the type of the context to type check this kind of, of expressions. Okay. OK, here is some more realistic example. The following function multiplies the elements of a list. So given a list of integers, we want to multiply all the elements. And you can write the program in a very straightforward manner. If it is an empty, empty list, then we just return 1. And if it's not, then we recursively um, multiply the rest of the list and then multiply the first element by that. And <coughs> But because we are multiplying the numbers, if we know that there is some zero somewhere in, in the list, then we know that the result will be zero anyway. So the question is, can we insert the zero close there and avoid all the multiplication when we found, found zero? So we want to replace that question mark with something so that when we, encounter, when we see zero, then we want to avoid all the multiplication. It is tempting to replace that question mark with zero. So this is one step, is going one step forward because it avoids traversing the rest of the list once zero is found. So for example, if we say times of one to zero four, then we recursively um, expand the call and we reach to, the, to zero. And at this point, we see zero, so we just return zero, avoiding to go into the rest of the list. So we don't have to do multiplication zero times four, but we just return zero. But still, we multiply zero times two times one. So how can we discard that part also? And the answer is to discard the current continuation. So we, rather than just um, just returning zero, we, we say shift fun k zero. So <clears throat> we discuss the current contention and return zero. So let's see what happens again. So if we have times of one to zero four, then we recursively uh, expand the call and we finally get to the zero. And at this point, we say shift k. And so the current con continuation, which is two, one times two, that is discarded, sorry, that is cleared, bound, bound, bound to k, but that k is discarded, so that part of the multiplication is also discarded and we return zero back. OK, so that's how it goes. So using shift, um, you can do a kind of exception and exception handling. OK. We, we have just discarded continuation, but we didn't make u any use of that. So let's use, the con let's use the continuation. So the next one is how to extract continuations. The idiom is shift fun k arrow just k. And if we say that, um, 
we capture the current continuation and return it. So because continuation is returned, we can use it, we can play with it. So for example, if we want to um, extract the continuation three plus and minus one, then we insert shift fun kk into the hole and, and let the result be named f. Okay, then what happens is that we first um, clear the current continuation, so three plus one minus goes away, and then we bind it, it to k, and then we, ex we execute the body of, of the shift. Well, because the body contains only k, and k is bound to the continuation, then that k becomes the value of f. So afterwards, if we apply f to say 10, then we can plug that 10 into the hole and we uh, compute 10 plus three minus one, which is 12. So this is how we co extract the continuation and, and use it. Okay, here's a somewhat more advanced example. Here is an identity function on the list. So it just traverses over the list, but we construct the same list as is. So if it's empty, then it's empty. It's fast constraints, then it recursively traverses all the lists, but reconstructs the first element and the original element again. By mod so the question is, by modifying the line A, when, when, we, when we reach to the empty list, um, we, we, won't, we capture the current continuation at that time and return it. And then what does that continuation do? So what we want to do is to replace the empty list with shift fun kk. And well, let, let's see what happens. So um, we start from id of one to three and we expand the recursive goal. And when we get to the empty list, we capture the current, sorry, we clear the current continuation, captures it into k and returns it. So what we get is the continuation which consists three, two, and one in that order. So let's name it uh, append one, two, three. So the append one, two, three is the result of calling ID with the one, two, three, and it will be, it will receive the captured continuation which consists three, two, one, in that order. So it will append, append the one, two, three to a given list. So if we, you pass in five, four, five, six, then we will, receive, we will receive one, two, three, four, five, six as a result. So the, that append is the somewhat uh, contrived definition of a current append function. So if you want to uh, define a append function, you just given list one, you just call the ID list one. And then the, it will traverse the list one and return the current continuation at the, at the empty place. And then that it will be the append. That will be a function that given the second one, then you can append the first one onto the second list. Okay, so this is the how to extract continuation. Okay, so, so now we move on to somewhat more complicated one, how to reorder continuations. Um, several years ago, I had a high school student and she was, she has done a game programming in Rocket with me. And she wanted, and when she created the, that game, she maintained a list of characters, a list of objects in the, in the game. And in the list, she treated the first element as, the, as, as, as special. The first element is the focused object of the game. So, <clears throat> so whenever she clicks some clickable object, she wants that object to be at the beginning of the list. And so you, you have a list of characters and you click someone, then that, that one goes to the top of the list. And this take function models that, that situation. So given a list, of num a list of numbers and the number n, and that is where she clicked. And we want to return 
the given list where the nth element is moved to the front. So for example, if you have the list 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and if you click the zeroth element, then that one will go to the first, but it's exactly the same as the original list. If you say three, then third element goes to the front. And if you say five, then that, non -clickable, that was non-clickable object. So the, the original list is um, returned as is. At first sight, seemingly this function appears to be very easy to write because all, the original list is almost reconstructed as is. So the, the return list is almost the same as the original one, except that the designated element is moved to the top. So um, we could think of this function as something like an identity function that, that we just showed you before, but some trick on it so that you can move that designated element to the top of the list. However, if the closer look at this reveals that this is, the situation is not that simple. Um, first, the nth element might not exist. So if there is no nth element there, so if there was no nth element there, then we have to do something else. So we need to distinguish the two cases, if the element was found or not. And when the, when the element is found, we have to carry that element over so that it, you, you can consider it afterwards. So for example, in the, in the second example, if you want to move the third element to the list, so you traverse over the list to the third element, and when you see it, you keep it somewhere else, and you have to consider two, one, and zero to the rest of the list, and that kept element is const on top of it. So if we you write that, the function that way, uh, it will become something like this. So we first declare our type where we, we, we indicate if the uh, designated element is found or not. And then we have a loop function that goes over to the list, but it, it returns not a list, but it, it runs a pair of whether you found the element or not and the rest of the list. So if you encounter the empty list, well, we didn't, we didn't find the nth element, so we say not found on the rest of the list. If, we, if, if, n, become, sorry. if n decreases to, to the zero, it means that we come to the nth element, so we found the element, so we return the first element paired with the rest of the list. And otherwise, we recursive over to the rest, recurse over to the rest of the list, and get back. But when we get back the result, we const the first element to the rest of the list, keeping the found element there. And the take function itself will call this loop function, and when we return, <coughs> and when we get back the result, if the nth element is found, then we, we const that element to the rest of the list. Okay. Well, um, well, if you struggle with this program, then you, you will be able to um, get the, to this solution. But the, my point is that this solution appears to be very complicated. Does this complication really require it? And my answer is, well, no. There is a simpler solution if we have um, delimited contention constructs. So in this example, take function just called a loop function with a delimited context. And then loop function just traverses over all the list. And well, if for empty list, we just return empty list. And if this then branch was not there, the, in the else branch, we just recursive over the rest of the list, but we reconstruct the first one. So if we didn't have the then branch, this loop function is the identity function. Okay? But, well, then if n equals zero, we, it means that we found the nth element, so we do something, something strange there. And what we do is we capture the current continuation and we reorder the evaluation. 
So um, let's take the example there. So we want to have the third element at the top. So when we encounter the third element, what is the current continuation? Well, current continuation contains cons2, cons1, cons0. And at that time, we capture the current continuation into k, and we reorder it. So rather than consting the first first, um, we apply the continuation to the rest of the list, which is 4. So if you say k of rest, then 4 is, up, is past the continuation, and then um, 2, 1, 0 is const on top of 4. So we get 0, 1, 2, 4, and on top of it, we const the first element 3. So that's what we, what, what we wanted to do. So, so we reorder the consting of the first element with the application of the rest of the computation. So we, we do the rest of the con computation first, and we, uh, after completing the rest of the computation, we put the first element at the, at the top. And this is exactly what we wanted to do. And I would say that this one um, naturally express the original problem. Okay, you might say that this take function is rather artificial, and you don't you don't um, <coughs> have this kind of kind of programs very much in practice. But th the same idea can be applied to a normalization, and a normalization is a one of the compiler passes, and you name, you give a unique name to all the sub-expression of the input. So for example, given the um, a minus b minus c minus d, we want to assign a unique name to all the sub-expressions. So for, for that expression, the first thing, thing to do is b minus c, so we name it e1. And after that, we want to do e minus, e1 minus d, so we name it e2. And after that, we want to subtract a, e2 from a, and we name it e3. And like that, we want to assign unique name to all the sub-expression of the input. And um, interesting thing about this program is that when a normalizer en encounters b minus c, which is embedded in the deep, in the big syntax tree, you have to insert the let expression for that, e for that part at the very beginning. So it's not, it's not okay to insert the let expression locally there, but we want to um, insert the let expression at the very beginning of the expression. And this situation is exactly the same as what we saw in the take example. So we want to reorder the traverses of the syntax tree and insertion of the late expression. So here is how the anomalizer is written. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so a normal form will call the loop function in the delimited context. And loop function goes like that. Um, if it encounters the variable, well, it's just a variable, so it returns a variable. If you see the minus expression, then you recurse over the e1 and e2. And if, and, um, if you ignore the red part and return the blue part, then this loop function is the identity function. It just traverses over all the list and reconstructs the same syntax tree. But instead of that, you do some strange thing there. Well, well, what we do? Well, first we want to name that minus expression, so we generate a new symbol x, and then we reorder the evaluation. So the rest of the continuation k is processed with the, with the generated variable x, and on top of that, um, after all the rest of the computation finishes, we insert the let expression at the top. So that is the, exactly the same as what the take function did. So let's see an example. Say this loop function is given a minus b minus c minus, minus d. So this is a minus function, so we recursive over uh, 
the syntax tree. So we have loop A and loop B minus C minus D. And that thing, that minus thing is the blue minus normal form, normal form two. And that one is fed into G, which is the red part. Okay, then loop A, A is just a variable, so it returns A. And loop B minus C minus D becomes uh, loop B minus D minus loop D. And that one will be passed to the red part G. And then, well, again, loop B minus C, B, B minus C becomes loop of B and loop of C. And they become both B minus B and C. So at that point, at that boxed part, we first and count, we first come to the point where the red G part is executed. And at this point, uh, interesting thing happens. So we generate a new symbol. So we, at this point, well, in this example, we generate the, the new symbol E1, and then we capture the current continuation. Current continuation is the rest of the continuation computation, so all the lines except for the boxed part. And that part becomes k, and then we continue the rest of the continuation k with the newly created variable x, which is e1. So that e1 is plugged into the boxed part, and we get the expression after in. So g of a minus g, e1, so that boxed part is replaced with e1. And and on top of that, we insert the red expression. Let E1 equal B minus C. So that's how you insert the red expression at the very top. And when the computation proceeds, the next thing will, that is done will be E minus D will be passed to G. And that, at that point, again, the G is executed. So a new variable is generated and let that expression is inserted. And that let expression will be inserted in the uh, inner reset. So that it will appear next to the let E minus, the let expression currently we have. Okay. And this technique is used in the Peter Tiemann's paper called Kogen in six lines. Kogen is a compiler generator, and he describes a compiler generator in a very concise way, consisting of only six lines. So there are six lines, and it, it defines a compiler generator. And three lines for variable abstraction application, because that is for the lambda calculus. And six lines, because we have static and dynamic variants for each of them. And in his paper, A normalization via shift and reset is crucially used to serialize the execution of expressions. And this technique is also known as let insertion in partial variation community. Okay, so this is the A normalization. And this is the last one. So how to wrap continuations. So in this case, we have this idiom. So we captured the current continuation K and then we apply, the, apply k to some, some result, in this case, hello, but it is wrapped in a, in a function. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> well, because function is a value, so if we do that, the current continuation is aborted. So um, if we, <laughs> sorry, um, if we execute this expression, we Capture, we clear the current continuation, binds it to k, and then we return the body. But because that body is just a function, so that becomes the value of the surrounding reset expression. So we abort the current continuation. And then the function will receive its argument from outside the current context. So we have access to the outside of the context. And when we, we receive that, we can resume that aborted contention afterwards. So let's see the concrete example. So in this example, we want to um, concatenate the string hello and the string world. But when we construct the string hello, we, we say something nasty there. And it says, well, we capture the current contention k, which is the red part. And then we clear the current continuation. So um, it becomes a second line. 
And then, um, okay. And then, because the body of the reset is now just a function, so it's a value, so it becomes a, a value of this reset expression. So at this point, this function, box function, will receive the unit from outside the context. So that unit resides in, in, in the first line. That unit resides outside the reset. But we have access to that reset with, from within the shift expression that is embedded in, in deep in the, in the expression. So at this point, we access the unit outside the context. And then after receiving being that unit, then we resume the current comp computation, which is um, adding role to help. So we have abort, access, and resume pattern here. And this pattern can be used to write the typed printf. And the, pro the problem is, the question is, please fill in the hole so that the following program would type check and, and, and behaves as the printf, as the printf does. So consider that, that reset expression as printf. And then printf is given the string hello and something and exclamation mark. And because we have something there that, is, that corresponds to percent %s, then um, we receive that, that part as a, an argument to the uh, printf expression. So world is passed afterwards. And in the second example, we, rather than world, we, we pass in the integer 8. So we want to turn that in, a, a, integer 8 into a string, and we want to um, construct a string, it's 8 o'clock. So how can we do that? Well, we just fill in that hole with the shift expression. You say shift fun k, and this k will capture the current continuation. Then abort the current continuation there. Uh, because the box part is the value. So that box part will receive the value x from outside the current, um, the current context. So that x will receive the uh, argument world. And then we resume the current computation with that. So we will get back the hello world there. And in the second example, the box part will receive the argument 8, so that x will be the integer 8. So we turn that integer into string and resume the current con computation. So we will get back it 8 o'clock. So percent s is the first, <coughs> is the first red expression, and the percent with d will be the second um, red expression. And this is the, well, I showed you the printf in using shift and reset, but this idea was given by Olivier Danby in 1998, and that paper shows how printf can be written type-safe manner in the standard functional language without using the delimited continuations or without using dependent types in particular. And it is, the trick is that it is written in continuation passing style and uses continuation in a non-trivial way. And if we deeply go into that paper, you will come up with the idea that um, that is very close to what I showed you t today with shift and reset. But um, in 1998, it, I think it was a great discovery that the standard functional language without dependent types can actually support the printf in type safe manner. And this was printf, but it can be generalized to state monad. So state monad will allow you to write put and get function, and put function will re store a value into a mutable store, and get will receive a value from there. So that kind of mutation can be realized without using any side effects. So for example, in, 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 in this example, um, assume that we have a sequential execution semicolon. So if we, we say put three, then the va value of the store will become three. And after that, if we say get, then that get will re receive the value three. And after that, we put four, so the, 
the value of the store becomes four, and afterwards, get becomes four. And the final get will be also four. So it's four times four, uh, four plus four plus three, so which that is uh, 11. How can we implement this kind of things? Well, the idea is that the let the context higher order and pass the mutable cell, the value of the mutable cell outside the context. And this is just as we did for the printf. So we write something like this. So in the expression part, we, we write put and get and those kind of expressions. And we pass the value of the cell um, at the argument to the context. So context becomes higher order, and we pass zero outside. So for, and then we can write the put and get function like that kind of um, expression using shift. So for example, if we say that uh, within the context, we say get of get unit somewhere in the expression. Then that get expression will um, execute the shift expression. So we clear the current continuation, bind it to k, and then return the function fun v, fun v kvv. So it becomes a second line. And then this fun v is a um, this fun v is the abstraction, so that becomes the value of the reset. And it, then it has the access to the zero outside the context. So we receive that zero from, from outside. And then um, at, the, at k00, we resume the suspended computation there. At that point, the, get, the value of get becomes zero. That is the first zero applied to k. And the second zero is the new value of the um, cell. And you can write the put in a similar manner. And this state monad is kind of thing <coughs> is actually generalized to any monads. And Filinski showed that any monads can be represented in direct style using shift and reset. And this paper is quite um, involved, and it is not very easy to read through. But the good news is that his, this paper contains a complete code in standard ML. So if you can dive into the standard ML code, then you, uh, then you can understand the essence of the idea without reading any text of the paper. Okay, so I hope that I, I, could, I could somehow convey you how I think about delimited continuations and how I um, program with it in a day-to-day -day programming. Um, it's quite simple, but it's quite expressive. And here now, I want to talk something about, uh, talk about the future of the shift and reset. And uh, my point is that the current proof assistants do not allow exception or shift and reset. So if you write a proof of a theorem, and, and if there is an exceptional case, then you have to um, case analysis if that, that, that exception happens or not. In, our, in other words, you have to write the proof in monadic style. But if we can use shift and reset in the theorem proving, then we can write, um, we, we don't have to write the monadic proofs, but we, we can just throw exceptions and do all that, all that kind of um, expressive programming in theorem prover. So I want to have, have that. But the question is, um, theorem prover is based on curry howard alpha isomorphism. And if you want to use shift and reset, then what is the curry howard alpha isomorphism for shift and reset? Well, I don't know. So we have to answer that. And before that, what is the type of shift? How can we type the a shift expression, and what is the logical meaning of that? Well, curry howard isomorphism says that the, if the, the typeability of programs in functional language corresponds one-to-one -to, -one to the derivability of logical formula in intuitionistic logic. And if you, you write the type system and derivation system and and compare them, then you will see that th those two are exactly the same if we, if we 
um, ignore the blue part, then red part coincides one to one. So that's a curly Howard isomorphism. And the point here is that the function type BROA is identified with the logical implication B implies A. So that, that is a crucial part. But then, um, what is the type of shift? We, we have to take that, whenever we talk about the type of shift, we have to take the type of the context into account. So if we have shift, then its type is um, affected by the type of its context. So for pure expression that does not have any shift expression, well, it can appear in any context. But if you use shift, then that expression can appear only in a certain restricted context. So for example, put and get function can appear only in the higher order context. So the type of shift is affected by the type of the context. And in general, a function type of shift will function type in the, in the system where we have shift and reset, um, it becomes like A, R, O, B added with C and D. And this type corresponds to the function type from A to B, but the type of the context changes from C to D. Well, the context of change types can change if you use shift. I didn't talk about that, but that happens. And um, for pure expression, we say we, um, the answer type C and D is always the same and polymorphic. So if we can safely ignore using the parametricity argument, and we can identify that with the uh, implication A, R, or B. But for the impure case, we have to deal with C and D, the type of the context anyway. And what does this mean logically? So we, in logic, we have implication from something to something, and we will never think about the, con the type of context there. So what, it, what does it mean? And one way, for, one interesting work on, on that direction is done by Griffin. And he said that call CC, call with current continuation, which is a variant of shift, it has the type a, 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 alpha to beta to alpha to alpha, and that is a classic type, so it's not intuitionistic. And, um, and that was an interesting result, but it does not, of course, it does not take the answer type into account because call CC is a undelimited contention construct, so it takes undelimited contention, and it, it doesn't have any um, answer type, um, the type of the context. But if we think about the shift, then shift moves around a part of the computation. And, well, it, sorry. If we think about shift, then it, we, we need to think about answer types anyway, the type of the context anyway. And if we think about what it does, well, shift moves around a part of the computation. But logically, we have a typing, we have a derivation for some formula, and we cut and paste the proofs to construct another proof. And that is what's happening in the logical world. So would, would that be the meaning of the um, arrow type extended with the type of the context? I don't know, but it seems that we need to think something about that if we want actually to um, introduce shift and reset into theorem proving. And my current conjecture is that shift is intuitionistic. And it means that even if we use shift, we cannot construct a term having a classic type. But that's, um, that's not um, proved yet. And well, I think that's an interesting thing to explore. OK. so. Today I talked about shift and reset, and my point is that shift and reset are quite simple, but they are very um, expressive. And there is a type system for shift and reset, but its relationship to logic is not known. You could, you could ask a question like that. Well, we can always turn a program with shift and reset into a program without using shift and reset by 
after C by CPS transformation. If you do CPS transformation, then you can always transform the program with shift and reset to the program without. So then, do we really need shift and reset? Can we live without that? And my question, my answer is, well, definitely we need it. Well, in long time ago, when the higher order functions were introduced, I think that people might have must have asked, do we need higher order functions? They are, they are expensive, they are complicated, they, and we can always emulate them using closures. Why do we need higher order functions? But today we know that higher order functions provide us with a um, higher level of abstraction and way of thinking and going further. And in that same sense, I think that having shift and reset as an as a basic language construct has an implication into the more sophisticated way of thinking in general. Okay, so that's, that's my talk. Well, um, you can use the Ocha, well, I have developed a system called Ocha Camel, which is a shift reset extension of Camel Lite, so you can use shift and reset there, and there are a lot of other languages where you can use shift and reset. So, happy programming with shift and reset. <laughs> Thank you.